Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, this is number three in our study of the lines simply presented. Now we don't we don't get as many people here on Sunday afternoon, but lots of people are still watching uh, these videos. Um, so as much input as you can have within reason uh, to help us through uh, looking at this. Now, before we begin, we're going to have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time that we have this afternoon uh, to open your word together and to look at the, the lines in their very basic structure. Even though it is simply presented, we know, Lord, that these things are very deep. We need your Holy Spirit to instruct us. We need your wisdom and understanding. We need you to enlighten us, to give us uh, the ability to comprehend these things and to remember them, retain them, and then share them with others. We are thankful for the time that we have uh, in each of these studies. Help us to use it wisely and, um, and be with each person through thy spirit. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so what we're going to look at today is darkness. So one of the characteristics of a reform line that I always say is the most neglected, and that is uh, understanding the period of darkness that precedes the arrival of the first angel's message. So that first way mark we call the time of the end. We have always noted that uh, in major reform lines that there's a, a time prophecy attached to them. So in some ways, there is a structure, whether it's a, a, an explicit um, time prophecy, such as the 2300 days or the 70 weeks or uh, Leviticus 26, dealing with the seven times um, that are fulfilled literally in or fulfilled with for literal Israel. We also have, of course, 120 years of Noah and uh, the 490 years of of um, in, in other lines that we have not just in the 70 weeks. And then we also have 430 years, the four generations, the 400 years. I mean, there's just all of these times, time periods, uh, 1260, uh, that mark a time of the end. So the time of the end, that way mark, which we're going to actually look at, next week is preceded by a period of darkness and since a reform line is uh, a reformation message it's a revival and reformation message this it has to be a revival from something right and that is the period of darkness so we're going to delve into this a little bit now in Genesis chapter 1, we see darkness right at the beginning. Of course, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In some ways, that's a title of the book of Genesis. Um, and in some ways, it's, it's a, a description of, in being a title, it's a description of what this section of the Bible is going to be about. But you could look at the next verses, the, the six days of creation and the seventh day, as a repeat and enlarge of that. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and then we go on. So this part, and it says, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. This part of it, in a sense, is a repeat and enlarge. It's, it's describing the conditions of the earth uh, prior to its creation. Now, as when, when we looked at this, when we did our, our long study of understanding the lines, we spent quite a bit of time addressing some of the details of this particular darkness. And what was what is the darkness that's being addressed by the creation of the world? Um, would that be the 
darkness that Satan had created. Okay. Yeah. So it's the misapprehension of God's character. And so the creation of the world is a revelation of the character of God. Nature testifies of God's character. And it's it's an, a, a natural out, outgrowth of God's character. Because of the accusations that Satan brought against God, God now is going to reveal his character, his power in creating this earth. But not just in creating the earth itself, um, because in this creation of the earth is also a type of the recreation that will happen after the fall of man. So God is demonstrating not just creative power, but recreative power, his salvation. And, and we're going to look at that and how these reform lines work. But, but we're not going to address all of those things afterwards. I mean, that come after the darkness today. We're just going to deal with the darkness. So the darkness is a misapprehension of God's character. Now, it's an absence of light. And we're going to look at that a little bit. So we'll, we'll keep reading on. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. So light is the Hebrew word. Or, and God saw light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. So we're not dealing with the light so much now. We're going to be dealing with the darkness. Chosek, Koshek, however you say that. Never said it out loud before. Uh, Koshek um, is the word darkness in Hebrew. And God called the light day. So... That's Yom, right? So, um, uh, and the darkness he called night. Now, night is Lila, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So we're going to look at these words a little bit because they tell us some things. Uh, so the word Lila, which is the word for night, it means a twisting or a turning away. That's literally what the word means. So it's it's the turning away from light. Now, why would it use this word that's twisting uh, for nighttime? Because darkness is twisting truth. Okay. Yeah. So So one of the things about the word night, if you look here... Um, there's the word Lila, night. It means night as opposed to day. Um, and then it's going to give us this other word. And, and the word that, that it's from is 3883. It means to fold back a spiral step. That's the twisting away, a winding stair. So, so why are they choosing this word for the word night? So you're saying it's because it's twisting truth. Okay, it's twisting truth. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know if I would say that, but there is a winding to it. It's twisting away from something. Uh, and we can see this also. Oh, if you've the, ever watched the, oh, sorry, oh. Theodore, if you ever watched the snake move, twists and kind of sidles. Yeah, yeah. Like a spiral step a winding stair to fold back. Um, now, I mean... That, that you, sounds like, almost sounds like the the way that uh, the moon spins around the earth as it's going around the sun. It, it, it actually looks kind of, if you would look at it, it would look like a spiral staircase. <laughs> okay. Uh, the action of the moon spinning around the earth. Yeah, because, yeah, I mean, we can look at this metaphorically, but but the idea is, you know, why did they chose, choose this word? I mean, they, they're choosing a word uh, to describe uh, nighttime that is a twisting away. And, and I can see this as sort of um, this this verse where it says, Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were, were evil. So, so there's a number of things we're going to look at here. We're going to go to the book of John as well. Um, and we'll, we'll look at these things. Now, uh, the other one is the word um, 
uh, darkness itself. So this is the word chosek, uh, choshek, choshek, right? So it's got a ch, which is in Bach, and it it's related to a number which is chakhashach. So it's just different vowels, and this word to be dark is a withholding of light. To be black, make dark, darken. Um, and in the Strong's, um, the dark, hence literally darkness, figuratively, uh, misery, destruction, death, ignorance, sorrow, wickedness. And it comes from 2821, which means uh, to be black, to make dark. And I think it was the 2821. Let me see here. So, um, so one of the things is to conceal or obscure, right? So it's it's something that's hiding. So if we think about darkness, we can see that people use darkness to conceal things. So we see darkness in contrast to light. Um, we see night in contrast to day, but we'll deal more with day and light um, in a further study. So, so we can understand um, something about Genesis chapter one as well, which I think most of us would notice right away. If we went to the book of John, it's going to start with in the beginning as well, right? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word that spoke everything into existence at the beginning is Christ. So this is going to talk about some of the same ideas that you see in Genesis chapter 1. And, and the part that, um, that's interesting for us here is verse 5 of John 1. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So when we think about darkness not comprehending, um, what does that mean? I mean, obviously, they mean it more in a uh, sort of a metaphorical sense to some degree. It means to, like apprehend, attain, uh, perceive. So if we're in darkness, here's the question. What is it going to take for light to shine in darkness? And we're going we're to ask this when we look at light as well again. But what is there about darkness? Why is there, why is there an absence of light? What has happened to create that darkness, I guess, first? So... We have darkness, it's going to be ignorance, it's going to be error, it's going to be destruction. Why does darkness exist? I would say because of sin. Okay, so darkness exists because of sin. Okay, well, that's true. I'm, I'm not asking the question very well, but. Okay, know. so how about um, that the source of light is obscured? Okay, so that's, the what, causes, of light that's what causes darkness. Right, so darkness is because light has been rejected. I mean, basically, I mean, darkness, I mean, we kind of think is darkness is the natural state of things. We need light, right? Darkness is the absence of light. So in order for a darkness to exist, light has to have been removed. Right, right. Uh, I mean, when we read in Genesis chapter one and, you know, it talks about this darkness, we kind of think, well, yeah, there isn't anything. So God creates light. So darkness is kind of natural. But if we think about the fact that God is eternal, darkness, in a sense, is something new.
Would, would we agree with that? Well, that sounds that logical. Okay. Now, I mean, there's lots that, you know, the Bible doesn't reveal to us. And we, we had some of this discussion in when we began under, understanding the lines, um, that series. And we, we weren't really sure. One thing that we do know as Seventh-day Adventists is that the universe existed before uh, the first day of creation. That is, angels existed before. Uh, we don't know how long they existed. We don't really know um, about the rest of the universe and God's, you know, nature and all these types of things. We don't know much about it. The Bible doesn't reveal this to us. It doesn't uh, satisfy our curiosity about things that we don't need to know. But we do know that the world existed for how, however long it was. We don't know, but it existed. That is, the universe existed on some level, whatever that is, whether God actually created all of what we see in our universe or whether, um, you know, it's just the solar system that was created or certain things that were created. We don't know. We don't know the nature of time. We don't know the nature of space, of matter, of existence. Um, we just know that they all come from God. Everything that is seen was created by God. It wasn't something that pre-existed that God used, something that he created. He created time. He created space. He created the laws of the universe. All these things came into existence by God speaking, by his word. And the fact that darkness existed somewhere, um, however we are to understand that, we know that this did not come from God. Because God is light. He dwelleth in light. So whatever that means, I mean, I don't know if we could, you know, try to deal with this philosophically. I don't think it's useful. I think it's just from a simple point of view, darkness is, in a sense, the absence of God. Because if God is light, and, and in him there is no darkness at all, uh, darkness is something foreign to God's existence. I don't I don't want to get too philosophical, but but is that is that understandable? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's understandable. Okay. And and so we know we have all of these reform lines and they all have darkness. And in some sense we would have to say that every single reform line contains a misapprehension of God in some way or other. I mean, the darkness that, that existed before the world was created is, is probably the sum of all darkness. But we know on, a, on an individual level, when we go through the story of Genesis chapter 1, we can write a reform line in the days of creation that would reflect not just the creation of the world and the creation of all things, but also the recreation of the individual, the conversion process. We all were in darkness. Darkness shined upon our, our lives, or light shined upon our lives in that darkness, and we respond to it, and, and we have a reform line. And, and that darkness that we're in, it was caused by something. Right, God. Now it says in the Bible, God creates darkness and He creates light. Now, why does it say that? Can God create darkness? I mean, the Bible says it, but what does it mean by that? He allows it, doesn't He? Okay. Just like He allows sin and suffering, He didn't really create it. Well, in a sense, he did. He created it by, right? It says here, I form the light, I create darkness, I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. That's Isaiah 45, verse 7. And. Well, well yeah. Theodore, mm -hmm. if, you, um, if you take the, when Satan fell, that would be creating darkness, wouldn't it? Yes. So God, by creating, so in in responding to, the misapprehension of his character 
I mean, he created the angels in the first place. Uh, you know, Lucifer fell. Um, so in a sense, God created these things. But he didn't just directly create them, you know, in the way that he created the universe. Um, now, this word create, bara, I mean, that's based upon the same word at the beginning. Um, you've got the ra part in it, but it, it's a different word. Uh, it means to create um, absolutely in the absolute sense, but in a qualified sense to cut down wood, select or feed as a formative process, choose, create, to create or cut down, dispatch, do, make, right? So there are, God has allowed things to occur as part of his character that we experience personally. So, I mean, the darkness that we all have experienced in our lives, God has allowed those things to occur. And he's done that for our salvation. Right? So he didn't originally create darkness in that sense. But he has allowed it to exist, and it still fulfills his purposes. One is there's the contrast of God's character to that of, of, of Satan's character, and also our own characters. Now, I want to move away from that a little bit. Now, when we look at a reform line, so here we have this initial reform line in Genesis chapter 1. What are some other darknesses that are responded to? So, for instance, uh, we're going to have a time prophecy dealing with 120 years of Noah. What is the darkness in Genesis uh, chapter the 6? Rejection, the rejection of God's word. They were given a certain pattern, but they, they refused to comply. Okay. He allowed them to go along. The darkness got darker and darker until finally 120 years were over. Okay. So we're going to be a bit more specific than that. So what we're going to look at is, and, and when we did this, we looked at the gospel promise. The first gospel promise was the seed of the woman, right? Right. And that message of the gospel is going to be obscured by, it says, and it came to pass when the men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wise of all which they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for he is also flesh, yet his days shall be in 120 years. And then it's going to talk about there were giants in the earth in those days. So, of course, you've heard of the Nephilim and people have all kinds of speculative ideas about this. But Ellen White's quite clear that what's actually happening here is the amalgamation of man and man. She's going to talk about the amalgamation of man in the context of this very thing. So this isn't man with beast. She talks about the amalgamation of man and beast, man with man, beast with beast. Um, and we know here that the sons of God are those that are following God. The daughters of men, right? So the sons of God would be uh, the descendants. I mean, probably if you want to look at it strictly, they would be the descendants of who? Shem. Yeah, so... Uh, so, yeah, that's going to be Seth. Yeah, Seth, I mean. Seth. And then we're going to have the descendants of Cain. Those are going to be the daughters of men. So that means that that line that the promised seed is supposed to come through is becoming corrupted. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, there's people who have all kinds of weird ideas about these things. And um, one group is called uh, the Branhamites, William Branham. 
And um, he, he had this idea of the serpent seed, you know, that uh, Satan ended up getting involved with, with human beings and um, that it's those that are saved are descended from Satan and those that are, or those that are lost are descended from Satan and those that are saved are descended from um, uh, Seth, something to that effect. But of course, what ends up happening in the story of the flood? What happens to the wicked? Mm, they all died. They all die. So can their seed carry on past the flood? Not, not their particular seed. Yeah. Just their characters, maybe. Well, the characters, yes. But but we can see that God in this reform line, what he's really doing, based on, on the context here of Genesis 6, is he's he's giving a reform line in response to a particular type of corruption, and that is the corruption of the seed. So is the seed corrupt as we come from Noah onward, physically? Yeah, you would think. Well, it wouldn't be corrupt because it's been purified. Noah and his three sons, their descendants of Noah, and of course his wife. They were saved. Hmm. Wouldn't be corrupt. Right. So, so it's not corrupted. So, whatever corruption happened prior <laughs> to the flood, I would, I would believe that God has, has removed that corruption. If, okay, that sounds logical. Right, because the promised seed, because this is all about the descendant, that, that promised seed, Christ, descending from Seth and, and being carried onward all the way to Jesus when he's born. He's a descendant. We know his line. The Bible is addressing that line of Christ. So in this context, when we look at this darkness, I mean, we can talk about the corruption and the evil, but it's really the mingling of this seed, right? That, that's what actually is being addressed. Now, of course, because of that, the imagination of the thoughts of their hearts are only evil continually. So God's going to destroy man off the earth, but he's going to save the righteous, right? There's, those are the ones that are going to be saved. Right? That makes sense. So we're not going to yeah. go into this in detail, but we can just see that the darkness is a particular type of darkness, and the reform line addresses that type of darkness. Because it's going gonna, it's gonna to wipe off the face of the earth, all of the wicked. And it's going to now preserve this, this new line uh, from which Christ is going to descend. So this line of Seth. Yeah. So, so the promised seed can now be, in a sense, pre preserved. Because uh, the idea here is that, that you're not going to be able to have this promised seed come through such a corrupt humanity that has existed. Right? I mean, obviously, humanity gets very, very corrupt as well. But before the flood is probably um, the most corrupt that humanity has been because man is living for hundreds of years. He has all of these abilities and talents um, that we don't have. And so if we can think about the every imagination of the thought of his art, heart was only evil continually. Um, now that man doesn't live as long, uh, it doesn't take, you know, the development of evil within the individual. Uh, can't go on as long but we also just don't have those abilities and talents that's the way that i understand it whether that's you know the best way to look at it i don't know but the point here is that we have this particular type of darkness and we have a reform line that addresses it whether i'm correct in all my sort of speculations in that case now we also have uh, another reform line so we're going to have the one dealing with the Exodus itself. So that's going to be Abraham is going to receive uh, in Genesis 15, um, this covenant 
and he's going to be told about 400 years and he's going to be told about four generations. And I mean, that one's a pretty simple one. They're in Egyptian bondage. And so what's the reform line going to do? It's going to deliver them from Egyptian bondage, right? It's pretty straightforward. Um, so this reform line, uh, though, has all kinds of characteristics to it, right? So when we looked at this reform line, we saw that there was a reform line for Abraham himself personally. And, and you can tie this all the way back again to the promised seed, right? Because God is going to now choose Abraham. So he's had Noah. We've had these generations. We had the, uh, the scattering of all the different nations now. And then you're going to have Abraham come and God's going to call him out of Ur of the Chaldees, out of Babylon. And he's going to give him this promise that, that this seed is going to come through him. Right. And it's quite a long story of how that, how that comes about. I mean, cause he's, he has to learn some things and then, you know, Isaac is going to carry on that promise as well, as is Jacob. And, and this promised seed, this is the, the double portion um, of, the, of the inheritance, the priesthood, and the kingship. Uh, but they're going to be divided amongst Jacob's uh, 12 sons. So the, that blessing, that promise of the promised seed, the gospel is going to be divided amongst his 12 sons. And of course, you know, three of them actually get the actual, uh, you know, Joseph is going to get the double portion, Jacob, or not Jacob, uh, Judah is going to get the kingship, and the priesthood is going to go to Levi, right? Now, in each of these, these stories, the story of Abraham, the story of Isaac, the story of Jacob, um, and in the story of Joseph itself, plus also the story of Moses, we have all of these different reform lines. There's going to be, um, and we're going to look at this in, in quite a bit of detail, actually, as, as we go through these. I'm not going to go through the, as much detail as we dealt with when we went through them originally, but I'm going to show you some of the structures and that is, in each of the structures, um, there's a pattern that occurs again and again. And we, we will see that pattern. Now, as far as other period of darkness, so, so let's, let's take Abraham himself. What is Abraham's personal darkness? It should be a simple one. Because he struggles with this. Oh, he's been, yeah, he'd been in Europe for I don't know how long and had been in, you know, in, influenced by paganism. Okay, well, yeah. Idolatry. Well, wouldn't his personal line actually address the fact that he doesn't have an heir? Yes. Okay. Because, because Abraham is a believer in God, in, in Jehovah, right? And, I mean, he's already starting to get older. He gets married. He has Sarah. Um, his brother, um, uh, Haran, dies, right? And, and he believes in this promised seed. He, he, he believes in it. It's something that has been passed down to him. He understands the gospel promise. And God's then going to choose him to be the one who is going to um, that through which the promised seed is going to come, but he doesn't have an heir. And so his reform line is addressing this point. Now, what about Isaac? What is his darkness? That one's a little more difficult. Oh, there was Ishmael that mocked him, and then there was a wife that was needed. Okay, so so with Isaac, 
um, because he's going to represent if we put Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then Joseph, you're going to have the three angels' messages and then the fourth. So I know there's a lot of things that we haven't introduced yet. Um, but with Isaac, it's going to be uh, first being mocked by Ishmael, right? So there's this, this other heir that is a competition with him. And this is going to be um, basically him establishing that he is the, the rightful heir. So, so that's what his reform line addresses. What about Jacob? What, what's his darkness? Would it be when he was fixing to um, <clears throat> meet, meet his brother? Okay, so saw... okay, so yeah, so there's going to be this conflict between him and Esau. And I mean, some of their characteristics, some of their things that they have to learn, they could have learned from, you know, Jacob could have learned from his grandfather or his father, because they start to make some of the same mistakes, but in different ways. Um, so his reform line, I don't know the best way to characterize it, uh, but it's this, this conflict with, with his twin brother, um, that, I mean, that's where the reform line is, uh, but it would have to be an aspect of his character. That needs to be reformed because these are personal reform lines you know abraham isaac and jacob uh, abraham had to learn faith um isaac learned obedience and and jacob he has to address an aspect of his character which is is deceit right would we say that that's part of his character that needs to be corrected because he's going to be oh man that's, that's been his main sin yeah and that's and that he's going to be deceived by others right particularly uh, laban right so he has to address that so you know we're not going into these reform lines right now in detail but we can see that there's a darkness that something happens in that person's life that addresses it if we look at william miller what would be his darkness Just as a person, as a person, because we've looked at his uh, deist, deism, deism, right? So it's it's his belief in a personal God who's actually uh, going interested in what's happening on this earth. So he wasn't an atheist. It wasn't many atheists then. Most people believe that God must have got the whole thing started, but he's really not at, that interested in what's happening. So, More of a hands-off kind of guy. Yeah. Yeah, he's just probably creating universes and things because that's what he does, whatever. But he's not a personal God, whatever he is. You know, he's not interested in us. Um, so each time we look at a darkness, we're going to see that there is a reform line. Now, some of the major reform lines then we could see with the Exodus, they're in Egyptian bondage and they're going to be released from bondage. So it's pretty straightforward. The Babylonian captivity, uh, they're in Babylon for, for 70 years. So we can see that uh, it's going to be a three-step testing prophetic message that's going to bring them out of captivity. The first decree, the second and the third decree, there's three decrees. And... Um, so, so we're going to see all of these different types of reform lines all have darkness. Now, we're going to look at uh, John a little bit more closely. And, and this is going to, of course, uh, 
we're going to look at this also when we address light, but because this, this is addressing light. So in John chapter one, verse five, the light shineth in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it, it not. So if we look at light, which is truth, and we look at darkness as error, Why does a reform line, or how does a reform line, um, how does light, because this is going to be more when we study light, but we, we need to understand this. In order to understand darkness, we have to understand light to some degree. Now, it says darkness comprehended it not. So it doesn't apprehend it. Darkness, what is it that darkness is not able to do? If it can't comprehend light, what is it not able to do? Just in the simplest sense. Can't be light. Well, it can't yeah, be light. Can't make light dark. <laughs> okay, so darkness cannot comprehend or understand light. Now, now we're people who are in darkness. So can we understand light when we're in darkness? It doesn't, it doesn't appear that we can, right? Well, no. <laughs> so there's going to have to be some, something that happens. And when we study light, we'll look at that more closely. But the one thing about darkness is it is, it is darkness, right? Somebody who's in darkness, an atheist, let's say, who, you know, doesn't believe in God, that God exists, he just believes he's his own God. He can create his own morality. You know, he doesn't, you know, somebody who's what I would call a consistently logical atheist who doesn't really believe there's any such thing as right and wrong because you can't really believe that there's any objective morality. You can have subjective morality, you know, as, a, as an atheist, but not objective, not really any true oughts that you ought to do this. Um, so if he's going to just analyze light, the truth, understand God's word, from that perspective, um, is it possible? I'm sorry, is what possible again? That darkness can understand light. That somebody who's in darkness can understand light. I mean, if he's truly in darkness and he doesn't see any light at all, could he just come up with light on his own? And you wouldn't think so. No. So in order for darkness somebody in darkness to see light he actually has to go he has to respond to the light you know this is this is going to be the mystery of godliness which we're we're going to address could that be could that be related to experiencing the light right so so what we can say about darkness is it is it is darkness That before you have a reform line, could we understand, for instance, Millerite history prior to repeating Millerite history? I don't think so. No, we couldn't have, right? I mean, the well, advent. Well, we, they hadn't been able to up until the time that we, we did. So, I mean, at we, least it, it hasn't been realized yet. Right. We needed a reform line, didn't we? That's what it seems like, yes. We needed, we needed a time prophecy. We needed uh, a time of the end. Right? We needed an arrival of light. We needed um, a person that was chosen by God to accept that light, just like God chose Noah, or he chose Moses, right? or he chose you know, Ezra, Nehemiah. Right. All of these different people that were chosen by God, 
um, that responded to the light that became these messengers of light. They couldn't have come up with this understanding without entering into a reform line. That is, if you have darkness, in order to have that darkness removed, you need a reform line. That's all we're basically saying, right? Yes. It's not going to happen because some guy happens to think it through. And, and we can see how, how that is, especially in our line. Um, because most of what we come to understand, how we come to understand our line, understand Millerite history, is because of the experiences we pass through. Because we, we start to understand the 2520. And in understanding the 2520, all kinds of things opened up that if we had analyzed, let's say, Samuel Snow's letters back in, you know, the 1970s, if somebody had you know, taken Samuel Snow's letters and noticed the dates, <coughs> put them on a line. Um, would he see the significance that we see in those dates? We might have been able to see some things. Depending on the circumstances, but, you know, everything basically has to line up. Right. And, and so part of it, why we understand uh, Samuel Snow's letters is because we were moving through them and they, now they became significant. And, and more particularly um, in 2018, so in 2017, we had put them on a line, we had seen the mirror, right? Um, and, and this could have happened of course earlier because a reform line could have happened earlier, um, but you know, it didn't, right? So. You know, these are always these big ifs. But once we we put these on a line and we had Samuel Snow's letters on a line, didn't we actually experience his letters when it came to um, understanding November 9th and July 18, 2020? We had this structure that was actually Samuel Snow's letters. And we noticed another chiasm in his letters that we hadn't noticed before. That is, we could put, um, instead of May 2nd as the center of the chiasm, we could put the first day of the first month, April 19th, as the center of the chiasm. And we found that the dates that we passed through, those 126 days that um, were being counted by Daniel from Brazil, that those 126 days were already in Samuel Snow's letters. Right, that would be going from the writing of his first letter to the Pentecost letter. And, and we hadn't noticed that before because it, it wasn't meaningful before. So for something to be seen, it needs to be meaningful, right? Otherwise it's just a curiosity. It's just, it's just trivia. We could have had Samuel Snow's letters and somebody could have noticed, you know, that uh, the dates that they were written on, that these had some connection with, you know, the Jewish calendar, dates they were published, things like that. They could have figured that out, maybe. But we can see because of the reform line, one is you're going to look at something in a way that you wouldn't look at otherwise, right? Because God is giving you light. And so, so my point is that in order for darkness to be somebody in darkness, in order to see light, they have to go through a reform line. They can't just get out of that darkness without some message arriving. Correct? That's what we've determined. Yeah. Yeah, so, and, and we can see that on our own personal level. You know, we're in darkness. We have no idea we're in darkness, right? <laughs> you will. Until, yeah. until the truth comes to us and we start to see our true spiritual condition. Right. Prior to that, we don't know we're in darkness. We're, we think we're all right. 
but something comes along and awakens us and we realize I'm not really in very good shape. So these, these periods of darkness, I don't want to examine all of them, but we're just going to touch on a, a few here. So we have the darkness of the Babylonian captivity. So that one's really quite clear, but there are different aspects. So one is, what does the Babylonian captivity entail? What, what are the things that there are going to be, because uh, you know, you're going to have the first decree, the second, and the third decree. What are these decrees? Why, why do they exist when they do? And why do they exist in the way they do? So we just think about the captivity, but there's going to be a three-step testing process to get out of captivity. So why is it important to understand the darkness if you're going to understand the reform line? Just, I'm, I'm going to go to the whiteboard. So we're going to use this as an example. Um, and we almost are out of time. So. so this is what we're going to think about for this week as we um, So think about this. Think about um, okay, so here we have the whiteboard. So we're going to look at a reform line, but we have the captivity. Now, what does the captivity consist of? How did we get in this in the first place, I guess, is what I'm asking. What, what book of the Bible, what chapter of the Bible gives us the captivity of, of Israel? 26. Well, th this is about Leviticus 26, isn't it? And this is going to happen in stages, right? You're going to have 677 BC, Manasseh being taken captive, right? Then you're going to have Daniel taken captive in 607. You're going to have 70 years of probation. Now, this we call the Babylonian captivity, the 70 years uh, in Babylon, right? Okay, so you have these 70 years here, these 70 years here. But you're going to have other things that are going to happen. You're going to have the captivity of Jehoiakim. Because <coughs> it's too loud. Sorry. So you got Jehoiachin, and then you're going to have Zedekiah's captivity. Right? So there's going to be Manasseh, his captivity, Daniel's captivity, Jehoiachin's captivity, Zedekiah's captivity. This is a progressive destruction of four. So one of the things that we're going to look at, and we're going to look at this in more detail, but that a captivity or a darkness happens in a progression. And it, there's four steps to a progress to a cap to a darkness. Right? We can call them four generations. So that's what we're going to look at next week. So we're going to address how this darkness comes about, that it doesn't happen out of nowhere. It happens gradually. And it's going to be in the fourth that you have this period of darkness. And that you're going to have then uh, a time of the end, which God is going to. Um, and we, so we're, we're going to go through this. We're going to take our time doing this because I really want people to understand what this darkness is about. I mean, today we kind of dealt bit, a bit with the philosophy of it, 
but I want to look at it practically on how it's drawn on a line. So every time we, we do a line, you know, Millerite history, what do we do? We go here, 1798, right? Darkness. And then we have our reform line after this, right? But what is this darkness particularly? Where does it start? um 1260 years earlier yeah so this is 538 isn't it yeah but this is what period of time what do, what do we call this period papal supremacy okay and this is also thyatira right oh yeah yeah right so that means before that so this is the fourth one you're going to have three that happened before this, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamus, and then Thyatira, right? Right, right. So, so this darkness doesn't just happen here. I mean, the darkness, this is the period of darkness, but it's preceded by three steps. And then you're going to have three steps to get you a reform line, right? So you're going to see... Yeah. Two, three, then the fourth, and then five, six, seven, if you wanted to look at it that way. Periods, right? Make sense? Mm, to me. Yeah. I mean, there's other ways to look at it, but the period of darkness is, it comes about in a particular way. It has to be created. It's not a natural state. I know, I know it's been a little bit too philosophical for me. I didn't really want to get that philosophical, but we can look at it in a practical sense. So I want people to think about this. I mean, we have another week, of course, until we do the next study. And I want people to really look at this darkness because we're going to go through this in a fair bit of detail, even though the lines are being simply presented, and this, this one's maybe a bit tough to listen to, to think about. We need to understand the period of darkness, how it comes about, why it comes about. So what, what these other three steps are that leads to darkness so that we can understand why the reform line occurs in the way it does. So we have to get to, to this state. People, a person or something has to get to this state where they are in darkness. It just doesn't come out of nowhere. Okay. So, hi, Stephen. Did you just show up? Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, we're just finishing the study, but uh, if you hang around afterwards, I want to ask you about your chart there. Um, so hopefully that makes sense to people. You know, people listening, uh, if people do have questions about it, if there's something they think that I've, I've missed or I've said wrong, uh, you can make a comment uh, on the YouTube page and I can respond to it. But I know we dealt with some things sort of... Uh, just grazed over them without going into detail. So I've made some claims that people might not agree with, or I maybe didn't make them clearly enough. So what we're gonna do, just to clarify this, next week we're gonna go through how this darkness comes about in this, these four steps, this progressive destruction of four. Any final th thoughts before we close with prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are very grateful for the time that we have had here. We know that um, there's much we do not understand. And uh, this is a huge topic. 
we need your wisdom as we think about these things and study them through this week. We pray that any errors that we have can be corrected by your spirit, by your word. And we pray that you can watch over each person and be with them in the personal studies. And we pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.